Uh, I'm Dick Betts, and I welcome all of you, especially the many of you who've traveled a distance, and some quite a long distance, uh, to share this occasion. Uh, Ken Waltz spent most of his career elsewhere, but he began and ended it uh, here at Columbia. And the Salzman Institute uh, was honored to have him uh, resident with us in recent years. So we're happy to host this memorial. Uh, and we can all see that the turnout reflects the unusual regard that Ken's friends, colleagues, students, and protégés have for him. Uh, we have a number of scheduled speakers on the program uh, from Ken's family uh, and people who connected with him professionally over the years. And we'll have some time uh, to uh, open the microphone for comments by others who might want to say a few words. Uh, in addition, uh, we have a few written tributes to Ken, uh, which uh, can be made available. Uh, we, we don't have them here, do we, Ingrid? Okay, but uh, we can make them available later. Uh, there's also, a, as you can see on the program, a video that will uh, come in the middle of the roster of speakers. Um, and please don't run off when the session ends. Uh, it's followed by a reception at which uh, we can mingle and continue <laughs> reflections about Ken. And also there's a videographer who's trying to interview people and uh, get their uh, reminiscences and stories and observations. So if you get a chance, be sure that uh, you check in with the videographer. Uh, before turning to our speakers, I want especially to thank Ingrid Gerstmann, uh, the manager of the Saltzman Institute, who did the work for this. And the staff mentioned in the program who uh, ably assisted her. And also Bob Art and Bob Jervis, who helped to plan it. Uh, I'm not going to announce each of the speakers. You can see from the program uh, as they come up. But perhaps each of you, uh, uh, as you take your turn, might just mention uh, who you are for those who don't know and uh, uh, may not uh, easily tell from the program. Also, uh, at the end, uh, Ken's granddaughter, uh, Sarah Grace, uh, isn't on the program, but will be speaking at the end. Uh, so, Daniel Waltz will be the first. Well, thank you, Dick. And I want to thank the Institute and Columbia for organizing this memorial. Um, delighted that it's being held. One thing my father asked me is that I not organize a memorial. Uh, and so I'm very happy to be here and be able to speak with you without violating that promise I made to him. Um, I do want to keep my comments very short. My brother Ken will uh, follow me and offer just another few comments. Uh, let me just speak for a few moments about my father. Uh, grew up during the Depression, uh, had a newspaper route, uh, raised rabbits to sell to neighbors, who then slaughtered them and ate them. Uh, a son of two parents, both of German ancestry, uh, who spoke no English before starting public school, and either of whom who graduated from high school. Um, served in two wars. Um, when I learned as a child that he was in the Laundry Corps in the Second World War, my respect for him maybe dropped a bit. It was only later that I realized that that was a great position. As he told me, he's the only one that could wa offer washed shirts and hot showers. Everybody owed him a, a favor. And he ended up um, running the Kiwana Hotel, which was a resort where they sent American GIs for rest and recreation. I never realized he played golf. Apparently, he had developed quite a game there. Um, so yeah, I think the war years were very formative for him. Um, certainly, I think, informed some of his thinking. I, of course, had no understanding of who he was or what he was writing about when I was a kid. Uh, there was one occasion I remember we got into an argument because I had missed my Boy Scout meeting I had instead gone to Cambridge, Massachusetts to publish an underground newspaper for distribution in my junior high school, which made my father furious. And I made some comment about I had a right to do this, and he responded, with rights come responsibilities. <laughs> and it dawned on me, yeah, he is a political scientist. <laughs> but it was really uh, as an undergraduate and later that I began to read his work and get to know, know him 
as an intellectual and understand what he said and how important he is to the field. Um, and especially in the most recent years after the death of my mother, uh, we traveled, for example, to Greece where he was awarded an honorary degree. I will never forget the lunch where he sat with these Greek professors. He was smart enough to praise Thucydides to the sky as the original realist. They were delighted. <laughs> they were horrified, however, to learn that he also liked Plato. <laughs> He's an idealist. <coughs> so um, with those few brief comments, I'll turn it over to my brother. Well, I'm nervous and gratified to be here. I was uh, uh, my mother and father's first son and a, a problem child. And I'm so thankful to my mom and dad for raising me. And I guess the, the best a sibling can say is I miss you. And uh, I certainly miss both of them. And I just want to thank all the wonderful people that surrounded my father in his last difficult days. Daniel and Vlasia, Ingrid, Mira, my uncle Elliot, Aunt Barr, Bob Jervis, Dan Olick. And I especially thank Bob Jervis for uh, uh, community outreach and sending me that book. I'm trying to teach this class. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bob Gallucci, and uh, I'm very pleased, honored to have an opportunity to speak with you and to be with the family this morning. I'm not going to uh, talk about Ken Waltz's scholarship, its substance or contribution to the field. There are others here who are scholars and can do that far better than I can. About that, I will only say that for me personally, Kenneth Waltz provided the framework through which I have understood relations between states my entire professional life, and I will just leave it there. I, I, I worry about saying that because I wonder whether he would worry having heard that, but <laughs> there it is. Uh, now please forgive me, I, I plan to ramble uh, quickly. I met uh, Ken <clears throat> almost 50 years ago when I was a first semester graduate student at Brandeis. I took his uh, graduate IR seminar at the same time that I was his TA for an undergraduate year-long course in international relations. I found the graduate course, uh, frankly, overwhelmingly intimidating. Uh, the required reading was, on average, five full books a week, plus additional recommended reading. Since I was his TA, I had an opportunity to talk to him, so I, I went to him, um, not particularly smartly, and said, with huge understatement that I was having difficulty doing the reading. Uh, I'm going to quote Ken here, and you're going to have to believe that I actually remember these words. Quote, um, Bob, these aren't novels. Don't just read them. Attack them. It's quicker. In the undergraduate course, he lectured. He was not good. He was not very good. He was brilliant, a word I really, really try to reserve. He was really a brilliant lecturer in the undergraduate class. Once he needed to go away, so he asked me to give the lectures that week, Tuesday, Thursday. When he did so, he lent me his lecture notes. He handed me his lecture notes like they were gold. He said, here. This is the lecture notes. And then he said, don't burn through too much material. So I took the lecture ho notes home. I didn't want to look at them there. I wanted to go home. And I had Ken Waltz's IR lecture notes. I did. And I opened them up. They were thin. They, you'd say they look, now you'd say they look like PowerPoint. They were a list of words <laughs> vertically on a page. <laughs> I'm sorry, they were worthless. <laughs> and I was told so also were my lectures that week. <laughs> Ken loved to play tennis. 
I loved to play tennis with Ken. Ken was a terrible tennis player, <laughs> but he was really enthusiastic about the game. Everybody knows Ken's writing style. It's lean. He loves Strunk and White. He never wasted a sentence, uh, maybe not a word. He told me once that Huddy Helen, his wife, made sure every paragraph was well constructed, and that was right. Ken could be generous with his praise for colleagues and scathing in his criticism. The worst thing I ever heard him say about another political scientist that I had asked his view about was that he, and now I quote again, didn't have a theoretical bone in his body. <laughs> I, I didn't know I was, whether I was going to say this, uh, but he's not here uh, right now. <laughs> <laughs> I always appreciated how Ken seemed to tolerate my preoccupation with non-proliferation. However, he did make clear his disdain for the word, which it wasn't, and the concept which he thought was misguided <clears throat> and happily bound to fail. <clears throat> I disagreed, but that was that. Uh, when he sent me off to do my thesis, and I remember this very well, I remember being uh, in the living room, uh, um, Dan, and he said, don't try to write man, state, and war. <clears throat> he said, just write something serious. Just write something serious. And it made me think later, <clears throat> if you know Clint Eastwood movies, the character in one of his Dirty Harry movies where the Clint Eastwood character says, a man has to know his limitations. That was very good advice for me, very good advice. Bob Art and Ken were my thesis advisors un until Ken left for Berkeley. And so when I went off to write, I, of course, sent the first chapter back against advice. Ken didn't want to see chapter by chapter, but I sent the first chapter back. It was the theory chapter of my thesis, and I sent it back to uh, Bob and Ken. Uh, and they both sent the chapter back to me. And uh, Bob had written all over my 50 pages. He had the, all the white space on the sides were filled, all 50 pages, everything was underlined. <laughs> I could hardly see anything in it. But if you're thinking it was depressing, it wasn't, because I had noticed he did the same thing with Aristotle. So it was, it was, it, it was OK. Ken wrote uh, two sentences, three words. Uh, first word, first sentence, good. Um, second sentence, two words, keep going. That was it. <laughs> Ken, Ken said simple, incisive things like, I quote, Theory is always wrong. If you insist on testing it for accuracy, that's why it's theory and not description. And quote, we need to decide whether we want to be a nation or an empire. He really appreciated Tucker's book of that title. And if the former, we shouldn't act like the latter. In this connection, once I met Ken and Huddy for dinner in London, I was passing through. I had just uh, finished my uh, stint. Um, I had done inspections in Iraq and negotiations with North Korea, and I was moving on to coalition building for NATO in Bosnia. And uh, Ken was at Chatham House. And I sat down to dinner with Ken and Huddy, and Ken began the dinner conversation by observing flatly and true to his view of America as a nation, we have no business in Bosnia. It was an interesting dinner after that. <laughs> Ken Waltz loved his family, Huddy, the boys. He clearly loved his life as a scholar and a teacher. I think we all appreciated his wonderful mind, his clarity, his uncompromising judgments, his intellectual integrity. Like you, I will miss him. It's a great honor to be here at Columbia today to pay homage to one of the most famous international relations theorists to ever walk the planet. Ken Waltz was not just a major thinker for his times. He wrote books that will be widely read by students of international politics for decades, if not centuries, to come. 
There are a number of factors that help make Ken a seminal thinker. I'd like to talk about one of them, a factor that I think has paid little attention, but nevertheless mattered greatly for shaping his beliefs and writings. How any individual thinks about the world is a function of two considerations. First, his or her critical faculties, or what can simply be called reason. Second, the values and norms we are taught from the beginning of our lives by our parents and the broader society in which we live. This is usually called socialization, and it intensely affects how we look at the world around us. I believe, however, there's a marked tension between socialization and reason. Specifically, socialization teaches us that there are certain beliefs and practices that are sacrosanct and therefore should not be questioned. Most importantly for our purposes, it promotes a deep-seated loyalty to the group in which we are raised. Nationalism, of course, is pervaded through socialization. Think about the well-known saying, my country, right or wrong. However, when we scholars deploy our critical faculties, we are not supposed to be influenced by the values and norms that have been programmed into us. Instead, we are supposed to be ruthlessly rational in assessing how our world does and should operate. We are supposed to be concerned with one thing, the pursuit of truth. That means that when we assess our own tribe's behavior, we put aside our deep-seated feelings and we evaluate it the same way we would evaluate any other tribe. This is what the science in political science is supposed to be all about. In the tug of war between socialization and reason, socialization often gets in the way of our critical faculties, sometimes in harmful ways. Much of this is due to the fact that we undergo significant socialization long before our critical faculties are well developed and ready for prime time. In other words, we are hardwired to see the world in particular ways well before we have the capability to see things for ourselves. Plus, the socialization process never stops. So it's always there as a threat to our ability to reason smartly. I have been in the academy for roughly 40 years, and I have encountered countless scholars with first-rate minds. Ken Waltz is the purest critical thinker I have ever met. When he dealt with any intellectual issue, and when he dealt with other people, he paid little attention to what others thought was right or wrong. He also paid little heed to conventional wisdoms, and he paid little attention to other people's feelings. He told you what his critical faculties told him was right or wrong, and if you didn't like it, too bad. This intellectual ruthlessness allowed him to make important arguments that tended to shock the people around him because they had been socialized to think in particular ways about the key issues of the day, and he challenged those accepted wisdoms. In short, Ken's ability to decisively privilege reason over socialization helped him become a contrarian, and more importantly, but relatedly, a brilliant scholar who influenced all of us and will influence many more people long after he and we are gone. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Diane Funstein, and I started working with Ken in the summer of 2010 as his research assistant when I was working on my own dissertation. And during that summer, Ken was summering in Maine, and he would call me up every couple of days and dictate to me over the phone the latest part of an article he was working on for the national interest. But in the course of, of our time uh, in working as his RA, I eventually developed the courage to ask him to look at some of my own work. 
and he eventually agreed to serve on my dissertation committee. But the most consistent feedback I got from him was that I did not know how to use commas, and why was it taking so long? Because he had written the manuscript that became Man, the State, and War in 14 months, part-time, as he liked to remind me, <laughs> consistently. But um, more than Ken's influence on my work, I think the biggest impact that he had on my life was just that he was such an amazing friend, and I really think of his friendship as one of the greatest gifts that I, that I received during my time when I lived in New York. Um, he came into my life right around the time that I lost three of my own grandparents, and he became sort of almost like an additional grandfather to me. Um, some of my, a couple of my fondest memories are, uh, one time we went to this exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art on Kandinsky's women, and we both sort of made our way through the exhibit, and we came out the other side and looked at each other and said, well, I'm glad I saw that, but that's not for me. And then we moved on to lunch at the Modern, which is the lovely restaurant there, and which was the real attraction of the, uh, the visit to MoMA. Um, in fact, I, I came to respect Ken so much as a friend that when I started dating the man who would become my husband, I was as nervous about introducing him to Ken as I had been introducing him to my parents. Uh, but it went quite well. When we, uh, Ken invited us over to share some steak and kidney pie that he'd brought back from his trip to Harrods, actually tinned. And I was a little bit nervous about that enterprise, so we, we prepared some additional food in my apartment before we went over to see him. But it turned out to be a wonderful evening. Uh, my now husband and Ken traded stories about their time in the Army. And Ken shared all of his stories about his travels around the world, his life um, with his wife and his family. And we finally begged Ken to let us leave at around 3 in the morning. I was desperate. I, I know. We, we'd gone through a couple of bottles of wine. And Ken was still raring to go, playing um, this new CD, I think, that Sarah had sent him, music from the 1940s. But I was just desperate. I had my dissertation due in a month. And we finally had to, <laughs> we finally had to beg off and, and leave. But I, as I said, I, think, I know that Ken will have a major impact on me as a scholar throughout my career, but mostly I'll remember him as this amazing friend that I had in my life when I lived in New York, and the fact that he took so much joy in the friendships in his life and in his family and in the beauty that he saw in his life in New York every day. So, thank you. Hi, <coughs> so I'm Shai Feldman, and uh, <coughs> last month was uh, exactly uh, 40 years uh, since uh, I came to Berkeley and uh, Steve and I met before Barry came by and Steve Walt later. <coughs> and uh, so I'll just, uh, I have to tell you that I lost some sleep over the last couple of days um, trying to confront this issue of how do I talk for five minutes about Ken. Um, especially after uh, some already uh, eloquent words that have been spoken. So I'll try to explain to you in five minutes why uh, I consider myself so, so lucky uh, to have been uh, one of Ken's students and why I regard, in a way, these days as kind of closing a circle uh, that opened literally 40 years ago exactly. So what did I learn from Ken? Uh, a few things. Number one, be bold, be relevant. Ken was the antithesis of what Steve Van Ever calls the cult of irrelevance. Ken was the cult of the relevance, you know, uh, and uh, always asked big questions, never bothered. Uh, by, by small questions. Always it was the causes of war or how the different power configurations in the international system produce different uh, international relations. So I wrote a bold dissertation, so bold that it took a year and a half for the Israeli censor to allow me to publish a thesis that was already approved by Berkeley as a PhD a year and a half uh, uh, earlier. So that's number one. Number two, and that some of you may be surprised, be open and actually be willing to even change your mind in the face of a compelling argument. The reason I say, first of all, I think many of you think that's, that can't be Ken. 
But actually, uh, it was Ken. Um, when Stephen Ever and I traveled to Maine in 1977, um, Bob Gallucci, I think, left. But actually, until that point, Ken was actually quite skeptical about, um, about the issue of nuclear weapons. And it was a combination, actually, I'm stealing some of Steve's words, uh, two papers that Steve wrote and a proposal that I wrote uh, that uh, actually changed his mind. We actually spent some days with Ken up in Harborside, and we actually changed his mind, remarkably enough. Um, now, we didn't intend Ken to go so far. <laughs> we, didn't say, we didn't say more would be better anywhere, anytime. <laughs> From my perspective, it was one more. <laughs> uh, but it's, it worked. Uh, and, and so that's number two. Number three, and this is, I'm uh, very serious about this, uh, two things that are interrelated. Right sharply is if you're holding a chef's knife and coupled with that, basically, he said, don't write a PhD. He said, write a book, we'll give you the PhD. <laughs> and, uh, and what he meant by that is don't write this for your committee. You know, write it for a larger, larger audience. Don't worry about your committee. <coughs> but, but that didn't mean I didn't worry about him. <laughs> uh, just don't worry about your committee. You know, we'll sign the dissertation. That actually was a kind of a funny episode because when I was ready for him to sign the, the, the dissertation, he was in Washington and he said, oh, Hadi and I are going to the East Wing of the National Gallery. Why don't you meet us and we'll get the dissertation signed. Don't worry about it. So I met them and we went there and then we opened the truck, the trunk of my rented car and I put the thesis on the back on the trunk and Ken signed <laughs> my dissertation. Uh, so, uh, and I have to say on one count, I have a different recollection than Bob Gallucci. I, I'm also thankful to Ken because at that time, at least my memory is, that uh, while Ken was the sharpest, sharpest, sharpest writer that I've ever encountered until that point, he actually wasn't such a clear teacher at that point. I think his teaching actually improved later. But that actually gave us a fantastic role. Those of us who were his teaching assistants, we actually ended up interpreting Ken uh, to these completely bewildered undergraduate uh, <laughs> students. Um, and then I guess I wasn't a total, total failure uh, on that count because he actually recommended me for the first <laughs> teaching job that I had when I was still a PhD student when UC Davis panicked because they needed somebody uh, urgently and Ken uh, and Ken um, recommended me. Um, I mentioned to a few of you that my son, who's now 37 years old, was born, practically born in Ken and Huddy's home. Uh, that summer of 1976, they, as many of you know, when they were in Berkeley, often rented their home for the summer and went to Maine. And I was very lucky because that summer, uh, the person who committed himself to rent their home double-crossed them Four, four days before, and Ken called me and said, um, can you house it, our phone, our home, which was one of the most fabulous homes in the Bay Area with the unbelievable view. And I said, Ken, you know that my wife is pregnant. She's going to give birth in August. So Ken said, perfect. <laughs> so you'll have a, so of course, because he knew that my in-laws were coming and my parents were not so far away. So actually, we brought my son when he was two days old uh, to spend his first few weeks in Ken, Ken and Huddy's home. Let me just say, uh, close by telling you why do I regard these days as almost closing a circle for me that opened uh, 40 uh, years ago. Um, in the last six summers, I've been engaged with uh, two colleagues of mine from the Arab world, my closest colleague of mine from Palestine, Khalil Shikaki, and my closest colleagues from Egypt, Abdulmunim Saeed, in writing the first university textbook on the Arab-Israeli conflict that is co-authored by an Israeli, a Palestinian, and an Egyptian. And what we did in this book, it's a short plug, 
was uh, to provide students uh, a sense of the uncontested part of the history. Then what were the competing narratives, the Israeli narrative, the Palestinian narrative, and the Egyptian narrative. And then a toolbox, an analytical toolbox, for understanding and analyzing developments in the Arab-Israeli conflict. And the toolbox that we adopted, and the only scholar that's mentioned in our introduction, we basically adapted Ken's prism of the three images. And um, so um, essentially what we have now with this book that is coming out in five or six uh, weeks is that actually when we came to the third section of every chapter, we forgot that we were an Israeli, a Palestinian, and an Egyptian. And we were three political scientists that adopted Ken's prism for understanding international politics by asking ourselves what I think, again, with some adaptation, Ken would ask himself, if you want to understand something in the history of the conflict, what is it in the international system that, that happened that can explain this? What happened in the regional system that can explain this? But we also looked at the other two images. What is in the domestic politics? And what is in the role of individuals that can explain this? Uh, so I think, you know, after for exactly 40 years, to be able to produce this and to, again, for three uh, Israeli and Arab political scientists to come around and essentially for Ken to be able to bring us around one prism, one toolbox to, to understand uh, the conflict is the reason why I have a sense that a circle that opened 40 years ago um, is, is closing for me at least these weeks. Thank you. I'm Steve Van Evra. Um, Ken Waltz was my thesis supervisor at Berkeley uh, many years ago, where I studied along with uh, Shai Feldman, Steve Walt, and uh, Barry Posen, and, and several other people here who came a little later. Um, Ken Waltz was a brilliant scholar. As John Mearsheimer said, his work is going to stand the test of time for many decades to come. He had an immensely powerful uh, deductive mind and an immensely powerful creative mind, and his works of scholarship are uh, unsurpassed. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to uh, talk instead about uh, what we learn from Ken's life about how to um, conduct a scholarly career, about professional ethics, if you will, about the way that scholars ought to set their agenda and ought to understand their professional obligations to one another, to their students, uh, to the wider world, um, how, how, to, how, to, how, to, how to be and behave as scholars. Because um, I think Walt sets an, uh, a, a fabulous example on all these scores. And when I was a youngster at Berkeley, uh, I was too ignorant to understand uh, what a fine example Ken set because I thought, well, everybody's this way and, you know, uh, what Ken does is what the world respects. Sadly, I found out as I got into the real world, this wasn't always true. Um, so let me just un unpack a little bit on uh, in what ways do I think Waltz's uh, decisions about how to carry out his obligations to uh, the world, to his students, to his colleagues really are uh, uh, an outstanding example. Um, some of these points have already been, been touched on. Um, today, political science is under challenge from a number of quarters for uh, its drift into irrelevance, as Shai Feldman remarked, uh, and as John Mearsheimer touched on. Uh, Senator Tom Colburn is wondering if the NSF ought to be funding us and if we're really helping the world with the work we do. Uh, if we cloned Ken Waltz a few times, these questions would never be asked. Ken always focused his work on uh, the most important questions, those having two attributes. One is uh, the hardest questions and those whose answers will be most consequential. Um, uh, he was similar to uh, one of our great cancer researchers, Judah Folkman, who in his very creative cancer lab used to instruct his, his students that uh, we will adopt questions judged by whether their answers would be valuable, not by whether the questions are easy to answer. The only, qu only issue is, is this uh, an important question whose answer would serve the world? And he wrote on immensely both difficult and hugely important questions the causes and prevention of war, the question of American power in the world and how to use it, whether the United States should be in the Indochina War, uh, whether the U.S. should be in Iraq. Uh, is always uh, t writing on the 
the, the, the central questions and often the hardest. Um, many young scholars these days think the way to set a personal agenda is, is to look for the doable project uh, to do, if you will, uh, data-driven agenda setting where you first find some data and then you find a question to ask about it, which is sort of the, the, the easy, lazy way to do it. Ken was totally the opposite. He said, what matters in this world we, we, I will have faith that bringing hard thought to bear on the central questions will kick the can down the road, will teach us something. Uh, we're not going to consider whether it's easy. We're going to attack the problems that count. Um, second, he, uh, he, he was, as uh, uh, Mearsheimer was uh, remarking, unconcerned with um, making either powerful people angry or making colleagues angry. He, in his agenda settings, spoke truth to power. Uh, not, not not just to get attention, but, and if, 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 if one needn't annoy power, he wouldn't do it, but uh, he was also fearless about it. And he, his, much of his work cut very much against uh, conventional wisdom in Washington and against majority views on major policy questions. He was one of the earliest critics of the Indochina War, uh, back at a time when it was, it was really considered kind of in, unpatriotic to question the war. 1964, you, you got called names, lots of names, if you were too edgy about the war. Uh, and he spoke against it in those days and published, was a very early publisher against it, and on other questions too. So uh, he, uh, if you follow his example, you will be unconcerned with, um, with uh, fashionability, with popularity. That's not what scholars are for. Scholars are there to tell the world the things that it needs to know, not things it wants to hear. Um, third, um, and this I'm uh, changing gears here to talk about the way he treated his students. Um, Ken Waltz was a very a uh, strongly opinionated guy who at the same time uh, granted his students the right to be themselves and think their own thoughts and disagree with them if they wanted and to grow into the kind of people that they wanted to be. And again, when I was young, I was you know, too ignorant to understand what a gift this was to all of us who studied under him. I assume that this is how people uh, in the academic world work. Uh, but as I grew older, I realized you know, how strong is the temptation among so many senior scholars in academe to clone themselves. And it's, it's a natural thing because we all care deeply about our own ideas and we didn't get into our academic fields for small reasons and we worked hard on the ideas that we've developed and we wish the world would you know, see their brilliance and, 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 and adopt them. Uh, and Ken always restrained himself from any impulse to lean on or even, even give a hint that it was really expected that one ought to fall in line with the Ken Waltz way of thinking. And if you look at his graduate students who graduated under him, many of them went off in different ways, studied the world in different ways, used different uh, methods, came to different conclusions. And this freedom that he gave the students to develop into themselves was, it was a wonderful gift. He understood you do not create great scholars by uh, boxing them in and making them uh, follow a, a predetermined agenda. You, you make great scholars by letting them be free to, to, to grow in their own way. And he knew that, which sadly, um, everyone in uh, political science uh, doesn't know. He also, um, in his field management decisions uh, toward who should get fellowships, who should be hired, who should be tenured, the sort of field management stuff we all have to be involved in, he was immensely meritocratic. Uh, he never played uh, favoritism games. Um, and um, uh, I credit him and I also credit Bob Jervis and Bob Art and several of the other senior people for creating what, at, when I was young, I didn't realize what a gift this was that all those folks gave us, younger people, but now I realize what a gift it was to uh, come up in a field that had an ethos of meritocracy about it, where the young scholars did not feel that they had to, you know, kiss people's uh, tushes uh, or accommodate uh, uh, the uh, fashions in the field or worry about what uh, big shot professors at some other university might say in a tenure letter. Uh, the ethos in the security studies field always was go out and do the right thing. Go tell the truth about something important. If you do it well, take it serious, you'll get rewarded. Um, and again, you know, as I grow older, I can see this is not true in, in, in much of the social sciences where um, you have um, uh, uh, pressures to, to conform to programs that, 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 that students may not have wanted to conform to. And this was, again, a tremendous gift, not just be given by uh, uh, Ken. I, I also mentioned, I think, Bob Jervis, Bob Art, uh, a number of other people in this room really have helped create that atmosphere in security studies, in which I now value so much. And I think the field of security studies should be so proud of this ethos in the field that um, we tolerate diversity, we reward it, and we reward merit, not um, not conformity to uh, some um, f agenda of someone who's um, in an influential position. 
Um, he also, uh, in the way he contributed to field management decisions, uh, uh, promoted diversity. Uh, today we have a number of hegemonistic tendencies in our field, and I think we have a number of departments that are plagued with hegemonistic uh, subfields or, or, or methods tendencies or ideologies. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's a, uh, uh, a problem throughout the field that uh, everyone's not committed to diversity. And my view is, Great scholarship can't happen without diversity. You have to have diversity of methods, of ideologies, of questions. You have to have a conscious uh, ethos in the field that diversity is good and that if you are numerous and some other group that disagrees with you is small, you should let them grow. The, the point of life is not to crush and, and uh, uh, annihilate those who are different from you or to homogenize the field in your own image. Uh, and. Uh, Again, Ken was uh, a total believer in uh, um, uh, diversity. He wasn't, um, uh, he wasn't, he didn't carry it to the point of having no standards. He, he, he wouldn't support uh, tendencies in political science that had no rigor to them. He was very, extremely rigorous, very rough on, on uh, sloppy work, sloppy thinking, and, and, and uh, uh, te you know, work that didn't go anywhere. But uh, he also was a, a believer in allowing uh, diverse methods and ideas and, and um, uh, uh, approaches uh, to, to flourish in the field. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that, that ethos uh, came through to all of us who studied under him. And lastly, the way he conducted debate, uh, John Mearsheimer remarked that he was ruthless, if you will. I'm not sure ruthless is the right word. He was, he was, a, he was a believer that um, uh, by uh, being entirely honest, uh, one gets closer to the truth and things progress. And uh, he understood that a uh, debate where everyone's so polite that um, disagreements are, are veiled or muffled uh, is a debate we don't learn much from. And he took the whole study of international policy immensely seriously. This is a gravely serious business. Treat it seriously enough to have a serious debate about it. And if we have differences, let's hear them, let's ventilate them. He always did it, however, in a very civil fashion. Um, he uh, never engaged in ad hominem uh, uh, debate. I know he hurt feelings of people whose work he criticized, but um, uh, my view was that the way he conducted his differences with other scholars was in the end very constructive and really a model for us all. So um, my view is if we could clone Ken Waltz uh, a few dozen times, this world would be a much better place, not just because of the uh, b uh, brilliant uh, ideas he brought to us all, and the friendship he brought, um, but also because of the uh, uh, example he brought on how one should live a, a life that contributes to the world. So I will miss him. Uh, I'm Shibli Talhami. Um, I'm not accustomed to reading my speeches, uh, but for the sake of efficient brevity, uh, to keep to the allotted time, I thought it best today. Uh, efficiency of words is particularly appropriate in honoring the life and legacy of Ken Waltz, and the circumstances of my own encounter with this great thinker. Ken was a key reason I abandoned four years of graduate study in philosophy and religion for the study of politics. To be sure, I had already discovered, after spending a year of research in the Middle East, that my passion was in politics. But I had a big problem. I had never taken a single course in political science. As an undergraduate studying mathematics, I took one required course in the social sciences, which itself was the reason for not taking another. <laughs> the readings were far too long and unclear, especially for someone for whom English was a third language and was accustomed to the elegance of mathematics. My only paper in the class was graded down with no substantive comments other than the words, too short. Uh, as my interest in politics speaked, someone suggested reading Man, the State, and War. I was instantly in love with Ken's way of thinking and the path it opened. Not so much that I accepted every thought, but it was exactly what I was seeking. Rigorous, elegant, insightful thinking with the fewest possible words. In fact, throughout his career, Ken had a problem with wasting words. Uh, if there were a measure in our field for influence per word written, 
Ken would be the champion, hands down. I was already in Berkeley, so I made an appointment to see Ken and another scholar of international relations. The encounter reinforced another attraction I had for Ken and his work, his intellectual and personal egalitarianism. Yes, egalitarianism. As someone hailing from the Middle East at the time, I was frustrated with a national discourse that treated the region in exceptional terms. Popular those days was a joke I heard many a lecturer tell about a scorpion and a frog that supposedly highlighted the irrationality in the region. It was already evident from my readings that Ken would have none of this. Ken was often accused, especially after he wrote his influential articles on nuclear proliferation and broadened them uh, to the Iranian case, that as a non-regional expert, he didn't, quote, know these people or those. But Ken's work was grounded in something more powerful when it came to survival and aspiration, something that was sometimes hidden in his focus on structures and states, the universality of the human condition. This was as evident in his writings as it was in the personal way he dealt with all of those he encountered, and especially me. By the time we met, I had already seen another scholar of IR at Berkeley to explore the possibilities of applying to the political science program given my limited background. The conversation was brief, focused on my background, and never touched on my thoughts or proposals. He was discouraging, even dismissive. By contrast, the conversation with Ken focused on ideas. Even as I raised questions about his work, he engaged me like a colleague. He was respectful, even embracing. I immediately filled out my application to Berkeley. For me, the encounter with Ken was truly liberating and empowering. He became not only a mentor, uh, but also a father figure, yes, uh, Ken and uh, Dan, uh, and certainly a friend. We remained in regular contact all these years, exchanging notes that went far beyond politics. I talked to Ken a few weeks before his passing, uh, soon after he moved back to New York for one last time from Washington. He could live, even defy, the discomforts of illness. But one part was particularly hard for him to take, losing the ability to read, which he loved even more than writing. Thankfully for the living, the words he crafted so carefully will always be there to help us see the world more clearly. Well, I'm Barry Posen. Uh, I went to Berkeley about the same time as several of the other people who have already spoken. Uh, Ken chaired my thesis committee. I teach international politics at MIT, and I direct the security studies program there. It's a privilege to be here among friends and colleagues to honor the memory of really one of the greatest among us, Kenneth Waltz. And I would like to do something very simple here. I'd like to share three memories that I have of Ken, and I think they're memories that illustrate many of the things that have been said. Now, I first encountered Kenneth Waltz not in his corporeal form, which is kind of consistent with where we are today, but in the stacks of the Occidental College Library, deep in those stacks, as an undergraduate, perhaps in my second year or third year of college, I cannot recall. I came across the article, The Stability of the Bipolar World, which was his, really the first step in his great work on structural realism. And I sat there in that library, and I started reading that article, and I didn't stop till it was finished, till I had finished it. And um, like many college students then, I was very interested in international politics and current affairs. And like many, my understanding of international politics and current affairs was based upon a simple heuristic. Good guys, bad guys. Right? John was talking about political socialization. That's more or less where mine had left off. Good guys and bad guys. An hour or so of reading that article changed my entire view of international politics. 
More importantly, it changed my view of how politics is to be understood, that there are overarching forces at work that push states to behave in certain ways. The power of the argument, the verve and the clarity with which it was offered, cut a deep groove in my brain. And friends and colleagues will say, I have never recovered from this moment. <laughs> Aside from providing me with one of the handful, and I mean handful of lenses through which I view the political world, the article and Ken's subsequent work, work strongly influence how I do my own work and how I suggest that my students do theirs, as Steve and Everett pointed out earlier. Look for big ideas about causation that link together many of our observations about reality and work like hell to make it understandable on the printed page. This is much easier to say than do. I can exhort my students to do this, right, but it's their sweat that's going to do this. It's the sweat of the people who look at Ken's model and say, we have to do our work this way, not because it's easy, but because it's right. It's the right way to do your work. Now, by the time I entered Berkeley, I'd already spent quite a lot of time learning about national security policy and military affairs. I spent a year in London at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. I was somebody's gopher. Spent a lot of time just learning about nuclear weapons and conventional forces and NATO and all these things. And on these matters, Ken quickly decided, though I was a first year student, that I knew quite a lot. And he treated me with respect and collegiality in a way that really helped me to, to hook on in graduate school, right? Because those first months in graduate school, and I'm, many here I'm sure can remember it, they bring together you know, smart people from all over the world. They put them together in this hothouse environment. And suddenly you realize you're no longer automatically the smartest guy or gal in the room, right? You're, with other brilliant people, studying with even more brilliant people. And just the idea that somehow you could elicit some respect from one of these mentors, great mentors, was really a terrific thing. And I have to say that um, this is also a model in terms of how I try and treat my graduate students. Um, and it's not uh, affirmative action in recognizing people. It's that when graduate students come to us, many of them do know quite a lot. And I'm listening, because I haven't got time to read everything anymore. My graduate students are my teachers, right? That's the way I view them. And I think some of that I got from Ken. Now, later in my time in graduate school, I, I ran into Ken when he was working on the book theory. I can't remember whether it was in, in Washington or in London, but it wasn't in Berkeley. And, and by then, I had, had, I'd spent quite a lot of time wrestling with his theoretical writings. And quite by accident, and I mean by accident, I stumbled into a conversation about structure with Ken. And had I considered what I was about to do, I'm sure I wouldn't have said a word. I just, I, I wouldn't have started the music on this conversation. And I don't recall how the conversation came out. But Ken had this conversation with me without a shadow of ego or ownership in the conversation. Um, he really was interested in whether or not somehow I might have figured out something new about structure that would help him in his work and in his thinking. Now I'm pretty sure I didn't think of anything new. But it was really wonderful to participate with him in looking at his own argument from several angles, even though he almost surely had looked at it through every possible angle already. He was still willing and ready to engage. And again, I think this is a model. So many, I think, very nice and respectful and, and real thing, good, true things have been said about Ken here, and, and, and more will be said. Um, <laughs> his writing will influence our thinking for years to come. I, our scholars yet unborn, will stumble across his work in the virtual stacks that will perhaps replace the quiet place where I first encountered Waltz's work in the Occidental College Library. But his example is going to be there for all of those of us who knew him. The determination to see the causes behind the causes. The commitment to intensive consideration and reconsideration of his own argument to get it just right. The incredible respect for the English language and the commitment to make it as easy as possible for the reader to engage with his arguments, right? as easy as possible. It's a handful of things, but they're big and powerful and important things. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Dan Olex. Um, I was a graduate student of Ken's here uh, in my final semester, where uh, I did my master's here from 2004 to 2006. Um, and in my final semester, I took Ken's PhD seminar. Um, not long after that, Ingrid Gersman um, recruited me. Uh, she asked me, would you be willing to drive Ken and Helen Waltz to Maine? Um, I'm 
a native of Massachusetts, um, come from just north of Boston. I spent a lot of time in my youth in Maine. So of course I said, I love Maine. I'll, I'll go to Maine, no problem. Um, and that led to, I think, about 16 trips up to Maine, back and forth um, every May and just about every September or October, um, up until the very end. And um, I can remember um, the first time that I drove him up there. Before we went, when Ingrid asked me, I went out with a bunch of my fellow graduate students, and they said, what are you doing this weekend? And I said, well, driving Ken Waltz to Maine. And they said, what? You're doing what? They said, yeah, yeah, I'm driving Ken and his wife up to Maine. And every year, people said, well, wh what are you doing this spring? And I said, well, you're still driving Ken to Maine? And they said, yeah, yeah, I'm still driving Ken to Maine. Um, and I think, you know, the attraction of doing that, like Diane said, um, Ken for me very much was a, a grandfather figure. Um, I never, never knew either of my grandfathers for a variety of reasons, um, and, and he kind of filled that role. Uh, and it was really an important thing um, for him, and it was an important aspect of our relationship because, you know, he, he taught me a lot, um, not just about international politics, as everybody here has mentioned, but he taught me a lot about family, about marriage, and, you know, even the things such as, uh, you know, what it was like to be in a war. Uh, and, you know, I, I was very appreciative of the fact that I've never had to be in a war and the conversations that I had with him about just the fear and the fright that everybody went through uh, when he was in the military during the Second World War in particular, was it, it had a big impact on my life, had a big impact on how I view the world. Um, but enough about that. I, I, I want in five minutes, a little, a little bit less now, um, to tell one story, uh, relay one bit of advice that Ken offered to me uh, have a couple corrections for the historical record and then have a little bit of a sort of uh, spiritual uh, seance of sorts. Um, the first story is when Ken met my wife, um, we were dating at the time, this was back a few years ago, she was living in Boston, I was living in Washington and we decided to come to New York, meet in the middle and we'd go out to lunch, we'd stay with Ken, we'd have a good time in the city. So we went to Ken's and we all piled into a cab and we went down to Rosa Mexicano across from Lincoln Center, ordered three pomegranate margaritas or, uh, yeah, three pomegranate margaritas, one each. And we were sitting there and we were in one booth and he's sitting across from us and he s leans in and he says, so Allison, um, do you like nuclear weapons? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him like, I interjected, I said, of course she does. <laughs> but I looked at her and I said, you do, don't you? Uh, but she, you know, being from Boston, she didn't know how to reply to that. Uh, then the piece of advice uh, echoes what a lot of people have said already. Um, and he, he said it to me numerous times. He said, you know, Dan, um, it never pays to be right. I said, why is that, Ken? Well, because the vast majority of people in this world have no idea what they're talking about. And when you present arguments that counter what they're actually thinking, they're not happy to hear about it and you generally get demoted or fired or your pay is docked. Uh, and I said, all right, okay, that sounds about right. And I was working in Washington for about four years after SEPA and I came and took a new job with the police department here in New York and not long after taking the job, I wrote an article that was accepted to be published uh, by the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. And I got it approved by my superiors. And one day prior to publication, the leadership of the police department blocked it. And they wouldn't allow it to be published. And somebody said to me in the department, well, it's got to be pretty good if nobody's allowing you to publish it. I said, probably so. Uh, and so I, right after that happened, I went over to Ken's and I said, Ken, you know, uh, I had this article that I was going to publish up at uh, West Point and the and, uh, police department's not letting me do it. They're blocking it. And he said, I told you so. I told you they would do that. And it's like, you're right. You're very right. Uh, but my pay was not docked, thankfully. Um, but two uh, corrections for the historical record. Um, you know, I was thinking about them reading through 
uh, the variety of obituaries. And um, you know, one thing that I think is missing from them is that uh, you, know, you hear a lot about Berkeley, you hear a lot about New York City, Columbia, uh, all, all the beautiful places that Ken lived and traveled to, London, Paris, uh, Beijing, he was a big fan of. But um, Ken really was a, a resident of the state of Maine, in particular Harborside. Um, and, and I think that Harborside, Maine, uh, where I've spent so many wonderful times, really does embody Ken um, in that it is a reflection of his modesty. Uh, it's a very simple place, a very quiet place, very reserved. And I think it reflects how Ken, you know, he never really wanted the limelight despite his intellectual talents uh, in, in, his, in his central role in the field of IR. Um, he, he shunned the limelight. Uh, he, he wanted no piece of it. And, you know, it was one of the great aspects of going to Maine was to see on his and Helen's face both the sense of relief when they got there. I mean, it was a nine-hour drive from New York, so a long trip for anybody, uh, especially going about 90 miles an hour. Um, which he enjoyed greatly. He loved that. He was like, he is a fast driver. It gets us there eight, nine hours. Usually he have to take two days to get up there when he was doing it. Um, but I uh, really did, you know, I, I think Maine is the embodiment of who he, he was, a, a beautiful man in a beautiful place with a beautiful wife and a beautiful family. Uh, and, and that was very important, um, a, a very important place in his life. Um, the second thing is that if you know Ken at all, uh, and I think nobody has mentioned this at all, is that Ken was a Detroit Tigers fan. Um, first and foremost, he was a big time Tigers fan. Scott Sagan is very, very well aware of that. Um, I believe you both share uh, the, the uh, love of the Tigers. And, um, you know, the, the trips to Maine were always bookended, uh, really, by the baseball season, because we went every May, usually early May, so the baseball season had just kicked off in April, and I would pick him up in October, right when the playoffs are starting. So I'm from Boston, the Red Sox are my team, um, and we always, uh, Detroit's been very good over the past number of years, so we always had our teams usually in the playoffs, which really made for, you know, if we weren't talking about Bernard Brody, or uh, international politics, we were usually talking about baseball. Um, and, you know, it, it's pretty telling that today, this, this would have been the weekend that I would have gone to Maine to pick Ken up because it's Columbus Day weekend. Um, and we always tried to time the trip right when there was a, um, a holiday on the Monday so I could take a little extra time, spend a little more time up there. And the ironic thing is, is that tonight the American League Championship Series kicks off and the Boston Red Sox and the Detroit Tigers are facing themselves for the first time ever in the American League playoffs. Um, and and it, it's, it's tough to not have Ken here um, for that event. He would have loved it. it. It really would have made his day. Um, the Red Sox certainly, I think, were his second team if Detroit did not make the playoffs, given that he spent so much time in Maine. They, will draw and quarter you if you don't root for the Red Sox up there. Um, so what I want to do right now is, is uh, speak for the dead. Um, I have consulted the appropriate uh, authorities in Boston in the Fenway area uh, and have been uh, granted approval to do this. And what I want to do is just take Ken's old hat here and this is a very serious thing for a Red Sox fan to do right now. Uh, we are a very superstitious bunch, as are all baseball players. Um, but in, on Ken's behalf, I just want to say, go Tigers.